let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our worship, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless prayer silver and my gold not a might would I withhold take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose every power as thou shalt choose take my will and shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Well, good morning. Welcome to the joint Sunday school. I bet this is unusual to you always hear each other, but now you're all together. They we're a unified church instead of a divided church like every other Sunday morning in Sunday school. I told Brother Dean Hamby, I said, in our church, you never have to wonder if anybody's in the other part of the building. You can always see them, amen? Well, let's shake hands with each other and make everybody welcome. I am glad to see you today. much. Thank you very much. I am so glad that you're here today. Let me get every one of the missionaries that are still here with us today to come on up to the front right quick and let's uh, introduce them. They're still with us until today. Bring your wife with you if you would uh, and uh, uh, bring her. Boy, Miguel just leaves you alone. You don't even know where he's at. Are y'all married? <laughs> Having marriage problems already? Deputation hadn't started? <laughs> All right. Why don't y'all take about 20. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> my name is Miguel Sanabria, and I am uh, my wife and I, Mary Angela, we're going to the country of Colombia. <laughs> Sam Quinn, missionary to India. <laughs> Sam and Rhonda Wilson, serving the Jewish people in Atlanta and other places. Mike and Catherine Rustelli on our way to Bosnia. <laughs> Edward and Beth Dillis Reyes going to China. <laughs> I think they got marriage problems. <laughs> All right. Daniel and Anna Sparks going to Chile. Jesse and Faith Turpin uh, on our way to Indonesia. Is that it? How about a round of applause for these missionaries? Thank you all. All right, you'll hear from several of those, uh, these people today. I'm not sure how many. 
and then they will all leave and go on the road to go somewhere else except Miguel. He's still the Spanish pastor here for about another week, and uh, then he leaves us. And uh, so in the, in the meantime, we got a ministry in Cartersville. Looks like I'll be preaching in Spanish every week up in Cartersville uh, for a while. Till I get somebody lined up for that, so you can pray about that. They got to let raise up some people. And um, but I'm excited about what God's doing. We have the Spanish church with us here today. Uh, 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 they are here below. Here below. Does that sound bad? It's Sonica abajo. That's what I was trying to say. Vote por favor los de la iglesia hispana pueden ponerse de pie por favor. This is the Spanish church. Let's give them a round of applause. I love these people. You'll never know finer, sweeter people than Hispanic people anywhere in the world. You'll never meet finer, sweeter people. And so I'm very glad that they get to be here. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and we'll ask God to work. Father, I pray that you would bring honor and glory to your name today. I thank you for how you are already doing that at Vision Baptist Church. I thank you for how you're using your people. I thank you for how these people are givers and prayers and yoke fellows and goers. And I am so blessed by that, that you would do so much in our church. I thank you for the privilege of having our conference. I thank you for the privilege I've had of spending time with these missionaries. I thank you for Brother Dean Hamby and the great ministry he does all around the world. And I pray, dear God, that you would continue to bless vision and help us to accomplish much more for your honor and glory in the coming days as we know your return is very soon. And we're excited about what you're doing and what you're going to do. And we're excited about being called home to be with you. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In just a second, they're going to show you a video of uh, Canon Bloom. Canon is in, uh, he is in... Uh, uh, what's the name of that town? Dalian, China. And uh, he has learned, and last night while we were having church, he was preaching, and he will be home this week, Lord willing, he'll be back. He will be, within less than two months, he'll be married to Nancy, and he has already started making phone calls and lining things up. Is it ready? Okay, you're not going to be able to, the video is not their fault. I sent them the text that was sent to me, and Andrew said, this is not going to look that good. And so, but you can listen, it's only about 10 seconds, 15 seconds long. Now, if you were blessed by that message, say amen. Now, you shouldn't lie at church, because I know you weren't blessed. Does anybody here understand any Chinese? And that was a lot better. He would send me, when he first got there, he would send me the verse. He'd be like this, for God so. And I said, that's painful. So that wasn't painful, amen? But I could never be as painful as he is. I, I could have never been as painful as he was to start in 100 years. So I'm very proud of him and excited that he's coming. And I hope that you will be in prayer for him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and ask God to bless the service today. Father, we're so grateful to you that we're allowed to be in your house today. We're so grateful for you that we get to preach and teach and serve. I'm grateful to every uh, Sunday school teacher and grateful for how you work in their lives. I'm grateful for every person who is involved in discipleship. I'm thankful that most of the people at our church are involved in some ministry and doing a job and working around this church, and I give you praise for that. And I pray, God, that your name would be honored and glorified, and I pray you'd work in a special way, and I'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask the guys to give out the faith promise cards one more time. So if you don't have one, hold your hand up. Would you guys come to the front? Just hold your hand up. A lot of you already have a faith promise card. I want to talk to you about them. I will talk to you about them more than one time uh, this morning so that you can think through that. Just hold your hand up, and they'll give it to you. What's going to happen is you're going to fill it out. And uh, one side will stay in your Bible, and it will be a reminder of you to you about what you'll give. And so it'll explain to you, it'll help you remember what you promised. Betty and I were just talking about how much we should give, how much we should up our faith promise. We've tried to up it just a little bit every year. And so we're going to up our faith promise and uh, uh, ask the Lord to help us to do something. Somebody said it's not a faith promise because you figured out what you'll give. Well, I'll be honest with you. It's faith because I don't know if I'll keep having a job and I don't know if God will always provide the funds, but I'm going to trust God to take care of giving me a job. 
given me an opportunity to give, and give me an opportunity to be a blessing to missions. And so it is faith. You're promising by faith. There's nothing magical about this promise. I don't want you to go around thinking, i got to think up of some weird number and, and pray God gives me a million dollars. If you wrote a million dollars on your card, we would toss your card because it would only skewer things that we'd know that wasn't faith, that was foolishness. Because the truth is, faith is that God allows me to use what he gave me for his honor and his glory. I'm going to take my money and I'm going to use it for his honor and his glory. And so I hope that you will, I hope that you'll take this card. Now, listen, you're going to fill it out. And if you, uh, if you give on a, uh, a weekly basis or a monthly basis, you'll put that in here. Uh, so I, like we, we check, we, we, we receive our paycheck once a month. So it's promised each month. And so we only give one offering every month to, to vision Unless there's something special going on. If you get paid every week, you might want to do that every week. And you can give any amount that you want to give. If you, if you don't want to give uh, any one of the ones that are mentioned there, which Betty and I do not give any of those that are mentioned, you just put it on other. And there's no place for your name. This morning I asked John, I said, John Pearson, I said, uh, has Betty put our card in yet? He said, how am I supposed to know they don't have their names on it? I said, you know my wife's handwriting. That's not true. And he goes, yeah, I do. And so... No, she hasn't. So anyway, uh, but he won't know who's given it. I'll never see. I won't know who's given it. It's between you and God, and you're asking God what he would have you to give, and your giving makes a difference. Now, here's what we do. As a church, we support each of our missionaries at $100 a month. If they're a missionary, that's what we call a strategic partner. That means somebody who's not a member of Vision Baptist Church, we give them $100 a month. And... uh, we currently give about eleven thousand dollars a month to missions. Uh, that's in that we pay out every month. If they're a member of our church, there's twenty four families. They will get two hundred and fifty dollars a month minimum. Two or three of them get actually more than that. And so we are, so we give two hundred and fifty to them. And we want to take on some more missionaries. And to do that, we're going to have to have more income. And I'm asking you to pray. Would you give more money than you've ever given before? And I don't want you to feel manipulated. I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to do anything because I'm asking you to do it. But I want you to pray. I want you to say, God, how, what would you have me give? Now, there, there's nobody going to judge you. If you don't give a dime, God loves you. If you give a dime, God doesn't love you anymore. You're not doing anything to gain any merit. God's not going to be happier with you or love you more if you're a giver. But you will be able to use your money to give to make a difference. Now, let me show you something. Did you know that all the money you give is time? So if a person made $10 an hour and gave $100 a month, that'd be the equivalent of saying, I'm going to give God 10 hours of my work this month for him, above my tithes and above my offerings. If a guy said, I'm going to give $200 and he made 10, that'd be 20 hours. You see, these missionaries are giving their time full time. They're uprooting their families. They're pulling away from their grandparents. They're pulling away from their in-laws. That's a good thing sometimes, amen. Uh, And they're going to another part of the world. It is far more difficult than you would ever imagine to go learn another language, adapt to another culture, live in another place, and, and, and do an effective work for God. It's the most fun thing you'd ever do in your life. It's absolutely the most wonderful thing if you can get over the barriers. Barrier number one is getting the money to get there. Barrier number two is learning a language. Barrier number three is learning a culture. So you got to learn how to be somebody you weren't born to be. you got to learn how to be a different group of people so that you fit in. Most wonderful time in your ministry there is when they say something like, he's one of us. Uh, I can remember so much the kindness that wasn't true, but when you love people, you just kind of overlook it. Uh, I heard some of the Peruvians tell somebody one day, maybe someday you'll speak Spanish like Guillermo speaks it. He doesn't even have an accent. He speaks it perfectly. Well, I knew that wasn't true, but love made them deaf to my accent. Amen? And I was like, praise Jesus. Say it on, baby. I don't mind hearing it. It wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true. I think they knew it wasn't true. They are so kind to me. I can remember the first time we had a bunch of Americans, a bunch of white people came down to our church. And I can remember uh, after it was all over and everybody had gone home and me and the young men were sitting around. I said, how many do we have tonight? 
and uh, they told me, well, we had this many. And I said, well, uh, I said, now, uh, you sure you counted right? I said, there was about 35 Americans. And they said, no, there were 29 Americans. And I said, are, are you forgetting my family? They said, we didn't count you with them. We counted you with us. I said, yes, I like that, amen. I, I was no longer the white boy. I like that. And so it's a great thing, but you get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it. You get to get under the yoke with them. In our church, we have yoke fellows. You get under the yoke by praying for them. You get under the yoke by, you, by standing cut in touch with them and contacting them. You get, a, you get under the yoke by giving and being a part of it. And so I want to ask you to do that. I'm just unashamed. I'm not asking a dime for me. I'm asking you unashamedly to pray about what you could give. The other night, uh, I can't remember who the girl was, but Thatcher was Tyler Masters. He had a beard painted on his face. And Charlotte, Thatcher and Charlotte came up here, and they were Tyler and Gretchen. And their picture was up behind them, and I saw on Facebook that Gretchen was so excited about that. She loved it. What a wonderful privilege that you love people like you do. Well, put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your heart is. And when you put your money there, even if your heart's not there, if you put your money, it's like when you throw your money in, woo, like that, your heart will just follow right after it. So throw a little money in, and your heart will get more involved in it. By the way, you let, let a parent send their kid off to Mission Field and see if their heart follows. It'll sure follow. So I'm glad you're here, and we're going to have a good time today, and I'm excited about the chance to be with, uh, with you, and I'm excited to see what we're going to do. I hope during the service I'll talk to you one more time. We'll take up the cards in the offering plate or, or at the end of the service when we have them put up here, but uh, we're going to look for God to do more and help us to accomplish more. Uh, I've heard... Great things that I'm not allowed to tell you. I've heard that God's dealing with hearts about being missionaries. I can't tell you about that because I haven't been given permission. But I've heard that God's doing some great stuff. What a wonderful privilege it is to be a part of a church like this, to work with you and to serve God with you. I'm so excited and blessed and privileged to do that. Well, we're going to have our first preacher. And they got it big enough I can see it. Jesse Turpin. Jesse is on his way to the country of, he doesn't say Indonesia like me. He said Indonesia. He's going to Indonesia. And so you come on up, Brother Jesse. Well, I have to say it has been a, uh, this week has been a huge, huge encouragement uh, to me and my wife. And you folks have been so good to us. I just, this is my last opportunity to thank you. And so I want to be sure to do that. Uh, we came in, this is our first meeting and a little bit nervous. And uh, you folks have just loved on us and made this really easy for us. And so we're looking forward to getting out and uh, going to other meetings and, uh, you set the bar pretty high. Uh, the first night, we, we you fed us well, fed us well all week, but uh, but uh, we're so grateful for that. So Matthew 15, if you want to turn over there, we're going to read a few verses, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into a few thoughts about missions this morning. Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to start reading in verse 32, and we'll read through verse 36. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, uh, said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. You see what's going on here. The, Jesus has been ministering, and he's led out in the wilderness, uh, out of town, and they're away from the markets, they're away from the storehouses. And this multitude that's following, we'll find out later, it's 4,000 men with the women and children beside They've, they've consumed everything they brought with them. And Christ it looks on this multitude and he has compassion. And he says, and if they go away without me filling them, they are going to faint in the way that they're going. And I love what he says there. I, this is our God. And he says, I will not send them away fasting. I will not send these people away from me wanting and having this great need that I don't feel. And we the same scenario is in John chapter 6. Uh, I think it's a different time, but Jesus talks to me. He says, I'm the bread of life, and if you don't take me into you and consume me, then you're, you don't have a chance. You're going to faint. And so the disciples quickly figure out here that they can't meet this great need that's, that's there. In verse 33, they mention that. When should we have so much bread in the wilderness? But that's not what Jesus asked them. He didn't ask them, 
how much is it going to take to fill this great multitude? He's just asking this, is how much do you have? And so, do you realize God is much, much more aware of the need of these people than we are? Um, the question God really asks is not how much it's going to take to fill them, but how much of yourself, how much can you give to, be, to me and make available to me for me to use and me to work with? Uh, Jesus goes on after this, and he takes what they have, and this is his plan for feeding this whole multitude, is whatever you give, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to break it apart, and I'm going to give it back to you, and you're going to break it, and you're going to give it to the next guy, and they're going to break it and give it to the next guy. So that's the plan uh, for feeding this multitude, is just tearing, tearing apart what you have and passing it along. The other night, Brother Austin asked me about uh, when the Lord called me to be a missionary, and uh, I worked for nine years as a uh, for myself in a small business doing industrial type installation. I, I, uh, I built steel mezzanines, steel racks, modular offices, material lifts, and uh, the Lord put some verses on my heart. Uh, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. In 1 Corinthians 3.13, every man's work shall be tried by fire and the day shall declare to what sort it is. And I felt like in my life I was just hoarding up to myself all the things that I wanted. I had I had a truck, I had a bobcat, you know, I'm a guy, I like tools, I had, you know, a welder, I had forklifts for work, and I traveled all over, and I did this for almost a decade, and God just broke into my heart, and it, it was, how selfish of a life is that, that the things God has given to me, I'm going to hang on, and I'm not going to break those apart and give them to someone else, and, and through all that, Lord just uh, broke me and made me surrender into missions. And there's this great multitude. When I started praying about countries, I came across Indonesia. And I can tell you that Indonesia is a country of over 250 million people. But when I say that, God doesn't see, say, 250 million people. He sees 250 million image bearers of his. That every one of them has worth, and they have value, and they have a name, and they have a face, and he loves them, and he gave his son for them. And so every one of these countries, that's it. When you talk about India, or you talk about China, or these other places, Colombia, that guys are going to, these are image bearers of God that he's trying to reach, and God has a great affection for them. And he is more, much more aware of that need than I am. But the question is still the same. How much am I going to make available to him? There's nothing selfish in the gospel where I get to take and hang on to myself for myself is I need to break that apart and, and, and give it to the to other men. And so Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. Um, it is, uh, I had a few surprises when I started studying Indonesia. I, when I pictured Indonesia, I thought, you know, rice paddies and huts and you, the guy paddling across the river, uh, you know, they share an island with Papua New Guinea. So that's the image that I had. But when you look at the country, there are cities with millions and millions of people. We have one on our display out there. Uh, Jakarta is the second largest metropolitan area in the world when it stretches out and the city stops uh, behind Tokyo. Tokyo would be the largest. And I wonder in that Muslim country, that 14-year-old that boy that I was when I got saved that didn't have any of that knowledge of Christ, and he doesn't have anyone that's pouring Bible and pouring gospel in his life, when he steps out on that street, the only answers he's going to find are going to come from the mosque and from a, a God who doesn't love him and do, didn't send his son to die for him. And so, I don't want to hang on to what I have and not pass that along. And God's called us to Indonesia. We want to make sure that we we're faithful to do that and not, not hoard that to ourselves and not pass this along in that world. So I pray, hope you'll pray for us. I hope you'll pray for Indonesia and pray for these other countries. And uh, I thank you for your time, your kindness with us this week. And I pray God, God will bless you guys for that. Thank you. Stand with me as we sing together. <clears throat> we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land Climb the steeps and cross the waves Onward to this our Lord's command Jesus saves, Jesus saves Give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves, Jesus saves Let the nations now 
shall rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shall salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You may be seated. I am blessed to be the daughter of who I like to call Cinder Dad and Cinder Mom. Uh, growing up, my family was always a part of a missions-minded church. We were faithful church members. But it didn't just end at church. My parents lived out what they believed in our own home. And sometimes that meant doing the hard things. They had to say no, and I really didn't like it at the time. But now that I can look back, I can really appreciate what they did and the stand that they took for us. They always encouraged me and my brother to seek out God's will for our lives, whether that be as a pilot or a teacher or a missionary. It didn't matter as long as that's what God would have for us. And I knew I had their support no matter what I did. And that meant more to me, and it still does, more than they'll ever know. So I guess there's only one thing left to tell them, and that's thank you, Mom and Dad. I love you, Mom and Dad. You're the best Mom and Dad in the world. I know now that one of the biggest obstacles for people going to the mission field is often their parents. Uh, Mom, Dad, I would just like to say thank you that you have never been that for me. Uh, you've never hindered me. You've never discouraged me from wanting to go to the mission field. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was it's really your fault. I mean, who lets their 15-year-old go on a mission trip down to Peru for 10 days and then come back and he says he's going to be a missionary and then you allow him to... Uh, continue that pursuit. You don't discourage him. You support him. And you even helped me go on several more missions trips. Uh, you've never stood in the way. So thank you so much for that. That was perhaps one of the greatest things to help me get to the field, get to where I'm at. So thank you for being that for me. I want to take the opportunity today to just say thanks. Uh, there's some very, very special people in my life that have helped me become what I am today. If there's anything at all to talk about, I would have to say number one is Jesus Christ that has uh, called me to the ministry, that has placed me where I'm at. But number two, no shadow, beyond the shadow of any doubt, is having parents that truly, truly loved God. Mom and Dad, you guys are amazing. I remember watching uh, Mom every, almost every night in a pink cotton sweatpants sitting on her bed, and she would always have her Bible, legs crossed, always seeing they're just reading their Bible, spending time alone with God. Don't worry, Mom, I have a picture coming up at the end of my video so everybody can see your, see your sweatpants. The story of the life of, our, of us as gardeners is nothing more than a life of a lot of problems and a lot of issues, but Mom and Dad taught me to be real, taught me to forgive, and taught me to love those. Almost every time that I used to leave the house to go hang out with my friends or to go any place, my mom would always tell me, David, don't forget your testimony. And that's something that's always impacted me. I still even think that many times when I walk out the door now. Uh, I'm thankful for parents that were an example to me uh, in hard times and in good times. I'm thankful for parents that uh, loved God, not only in the pulpit, but outside of the pulpit. Whatever my dad said from the pulpit was real at home. And uh, the greatest thing that I ever learned from both of my parents is that they loved Jesus. And uh, they loved him greatly, and it didn't matter what hardships came in our life, that we were always going to continue going forward. So I'm thankful for the influence of my parents. I'm thankful for the way they raised me. And I'm thankful for being able to witness God's power in their life. Thank you. Hey, Mom and Dad. I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for everything you've always done for me. Um, I love you both very much. I just wanted to say thank you for always encouraging me to stay in church, for taking me to church when I was little, and for everything you've done. Thank you for being an encouragement to me and Kyle and being supportive of our journey to Peru. I just love you both very much, um, and I just wanted to say that one thing that has probably been a factor in me becoming a missionary is just the fact that 
both mom and dad have always kept us in church. They taught us the Bible when we were little. I can remember sitting on the bed and memorizing the 23rd Psalm and different things. And um, they would read to us and teach us biblical songs. And I just thank you so much for all you've done for me through the years. I love you both. Hello, everybody. I just want to take these uh, couple seconds to say a very special thank you uh, to two very special people in my life. And, of course, I'm talking about my mom and dad, Paul and Sherry Lowe. Uh, mom and Dad, as I look back uh, at the great example that you gave Jess and I uh, of what it meant to live for God and to love God and uh, just the great emphasis in our home uh, for missions and the cause of Christ and getting the gospel out and uh, no doubt, of course, a lot of that came from Dad being saved as a result of, of missions and people who gave to missions and so uh, no doubt that, that was a big part of our home and taking missionaries out to eat and hosting missionaries and uh, getting to know them and I remember uh, as a young boy many times looking and seeing dad uh, quietly in the lobby of a church giving a missionary that loaded handshake you know with the money in it just to try to be a blessing uh, just to try to be an encouragement to him to get him down the road uh, to get him to the mission field and so uh, thank you mom and dad for the great example that you've given uh, thank you uh, I can never say in words really all of what it means to me and uh, thank you of course what you've done for the cause of Christ I just, I'd like to say that I'm so grateful for the godly parents that the Lord blessed me with. I know I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for them. I'm grateful for the um, importance of prayer that they showed me and to always rest in the Lord. And I'm grateful that they showed me, they took me on missions trips and showed me life outside of my community. I'm grateful that they showed me that um, missions was more than just giving money. It was life on life. And most importantly, I am grateful that they showed me that God's will was always more important and far better than what was the most comfortable or the most easy for my life. Hola, mamá. En este día quiero dar gracias a Dios por usted. Quiero dar gracias a Dios por su amor incondicional que me ha mostrado a mí. Uh, yo sé que no ha sido un hijo fácil de criar. Yo sé que le he dado muchas canas a usted. Uh, pero hoy quiero dar gracias a Dios por usted y por su amor. También quiero dar gracias a Dios porque usted nunca se dio por vencida en mí. Uh, cuando me fui de la iglesia, usted siempre me exhortaba para volver a la iglesia. Siempre me exhortaba para leer la Biblia. Siempre me exhortaba para orar a Dios y para buscar su voluntad en mi vida. Gracias por orar todos los días. Uh, yo me acuerdo viéndola en su cama orando uh, por mí, por mis hermanos. Um, creo que la oración no fue en vano. Gracias por todo, mamá. La amo mucho. Que Dios la bendiga. Bye. Well, I'd like to invite the families up here, the parents of the missionaries. So if the gardeners would come up, if you come up here, Johnsons, if you come up here, Pearsons, the Littlefields, and Mrs. Sanabria. Hermana Sanabria, si puede pasar acá. We have something that we would like to present to you. The story goes that in 1792, a man by the name of William Carey, he's the, called the father of modern missions, and he went before a group of brethren, which are called before them, and as he went before them, he gave this plea that he was going to be a missionary to go to India. Well, one year later, in 1793, he went before these men, and he said, well, I'm ready to go. They had a send-off service all day Sunday, and they sent them off. And before he sent them off, he got four of those men, and he put them to the side. And he said, I will go down into this mine, this deep and unexplored mine, if you all will hold the ropes. Well, there was a man in there by the name of Andrew Fuller. And Andrew Fuller was the man who was responsible of raising the funds and was raising the prayer support and who loved them and was responsible for most of the majority of the work that was done down there in India. Well, you and I have a responsibility, and we are holding the ropes, but there's some people who have much greater, maybe, skin in the game, if I could say that, and that's the parents of these missionaries, and I think all of us should recognize them. We're going to give them a plaque, and I think all of them should recognize them with our prayer support, but let's give them a great round of applause. So we are very thankful. We've got five of these, and Brother Austin, Miss Betty's is coming right after the service, and we want to give that to them. 
Um, actually, that's just a mistake, but that's the way I cover it up. But anyway, uh, we are very thankful. So God bless them. We'll give it to them, and then they can go down. Give them one more round of applause. I'll tell you what, let's uh, have the guys come up and sing Our Heart, Our Desire. And that ought to be our dream that we would get the gospel message around the world. Amen? We want everybody to hear the gospel. I thank God for good parents in our church that have raised their children to want to carry the gospel. It's the most exciting thing in the world. So you uh, watch, sing along if you know it as they sing uh, this song, Our Heart, Our Desire. That's kind of like a uh, stockholder's report. Every missionary that went through there, somebody you support over $10,000 of your money. 
has gone to them over the last uh, uh, nine and a half years. And so uh, that was a pretty big investment you just looked at that you've given to. And I praise the Lord for that. Well, next we're going to hear from, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Sam Quinn. And Sam's a missionary on his way to India. And uh, he is a fine young man. He served God already over in, uh, he served God over in North, Northern Ireland. And I watched God use him. I'm proud of this young man. You pray for Sam as he comes. Amen. That's a little bit easier. I was trying to figure out what to do. Y'all heard my best stuff last night. So I have to find something worth saying today. I haven't gotten to talk to anybody, really. I've gotten to talk to people individually, but not about my survey trip as far as a church goes. One of the things about a survey trip and about getting to go to any, for, any foreign country, and especially if you're like me and you don't sleep on planes, the main thing you deal with is disorientation. And the reality is, is that when you hit somewhere like India, the first thing that will disorient you is the fact that everything smells, sounds, and looks completely different from anything you've ever seen. Thousands of people surround you at every point. It's hot, sometimes. It's humid, all the time. And basically, everything's just kind of strange. And some really funny things happen when you're doing that. See, the second day, we got the privilege of going to see the church and getting to meet Udom and seeing some stuff like that. And went to this little place called The Spice of Life. And The Spice of Life is a wonderful little restaurant. Uh, they have this thing called Afghani chicken, which I'm much so, very much so looking forward to getting to try again because it's delicious. But they also had this little green thing. It was sitting in this thing with onions and other sort of root vegetables and things like that. And I tried everything and thought it was pretty good. And that, in my mind, I thought, okay, green? It's got to be green beans, snap peas, something like that. And they have this chili sauce. And I'm like, okay, neither one of those things are real hot. So I can dip it in there, try this chili sauce, and see how it is. Well, let's just say that green does not always mean cool. And so I grabbed it, dipped it in the chili sauce, which is hot on its own, stuck it completely in my mouth, and... That thing put, tried to tear my head off. It really did. It tried to rip me from the inside out. And it burned my head off. And what I found out is that that was not a green bean, not a snap pea, but that was a chili. And it began to work inside my throat and my mouth and everything like that. And I think I drank a gallon of water in about two minutes. And uh, it was just a wonderful time. So you're disoriented. Then I was sitting with Doss, and Doss is a wonderful man. Doss and I could communicate because I speak terrible Hindi. None at all, pretty much, well. And he speaks wonderful English. And he was teaching me a few things and teaching me how to say what my name is. And I'd gotten used to saying my name with the ah sound. So Jim Roberts is sitting there and I say, um, Min Sang Hun, which means my name is Sam. And he's like, is your name Sam or Sam? And I looked at him and said, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, 15 minutes of language learning and you have no idea what your name is. And there were some wonderful things that happened and some wonderful things to see. But as we went around, we went to a couple of places. Akshardham, which is a huge temple to the Hindus, or Hindu temple. I have a book about it in my display, and it's a beautiful place and a wonderful place. But it is a place where they worship their gods. And as we were coming towards the end of the trip on Tuesday, we came to the temple of Hanuman, which is in Chetapur, where the church is. And Hanuman is this large monkey god, and he has all these worshipers to him, and this is a more practical temple than Akshardham. Akshardham is kind of a tourist trap. And what you would see instead of there being the fact that there were just these people who were there seeing the sights and taking pictures and, or trying to take pictures like we were, you find instead people who every day, they get up, they put together their incense, they go down there with their offerings, they take their food, they take their incense, they take their flowers and decorate these idols. They decorate idols to the Kalima who used to demand child sacrifices. They decorate idols to Hanuman, who is some man who suddenly became a god to them. And they decorate these idols, and they worship cows, and they worship all sorts of other things. And as I was sitting there and I was watching it, I hit what I call a saturation point. It was where everything that was going on and everything that was there and everything that I saw, it stopped being a matter of just being disoriented, and it became a realization that it was a place I just couldn't stand it anymore. Not India. It was not the people, it was not the food, it was what they had given themselves to. It was the fact that they were entirely consumed by these gods. They were entirely consumed, and those who are not consumed by these gods are consumed by the same things we are. They're consumed by materialism, they're consumed by money, 
They're consumed by making a better part of their life. They're eaten up by it. And I was sitting there and a verse kept running back through my head. A verse kept running back through my head. And I think y'all will recognize this one. I certainly hope you do. If not, I suggest reading your Bibles. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. These are simple verses. Verse 16 of John chapter 3 is the, verse, the first verse I ever memorized as a kid. But it began to hit me that it was not a matter of the fact that God just loved me. Or that God just loved us. Or that God just loved saved people. But the reality is, is that every child who walks by those statues and touches the head of that cow and speaks into the stone ears, gods that cannot hear, gods that cannot see. And every person who stands there and worships and bows before these things and prostrates themselves before these things and worships them, God loves them too. The reality is, is that the people of India die and go to hell every day. The people of America die and go to hell every day. And that is not the intention of God. It says that God so loved the world that he did what? He didn't just give the law. He didn't just give these things that we see in the Old Testament. From the very beginning of time, his goal was to give his only begotten son that the people of India don't have to die and go to hell. That the people of Alpharetta don't have to die and go to hell. That your friends, your family, my friends, my family, Das's family, Udom's family, Suresh's family, none of these people have to die and go to hell. It is the intention of God that they all be saved. It is an absolute necessity that we take this truth to them because God says, if I be lifted up, I will draw them in unto me. I will draw them to me. Please pray. Pray for the country India. Pray for me as I'm gathering my support. Pray that God would work there to see people saved. It is his intention that all men come to know him. So pray for me as I endeavor to do that. Thank you. I hope you'll pray for Sam. Quinn, now Sam Wilson's going to come. Sam Wilson's a missionary to the Jewish people. We first met Sam over in Russia. He's been used of God. He is a tremendous man of God. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Pastor, I'm, I'm not sure I should share this with you, but what you were saying about when you became one of the folks in Peru, whenever we had guests come to Moscow, we would roll our eyes and say, there's foreigners coming. <laughs> and you understand that. <laughs> it is such a delight to be to be here for the missions conference uh and we want to thank you for all of your wonderful graciousness and hospitality it it's just a delight open your bibles if you will to romans chapter 15. romans 15. i love romans i'm going to tell you a story that you already know and put a different twist on it that you don't know romans 15 in verse 25 paul writes this he says but now i go into jerusalem to minister unto the saints now, we know this story better from, 1 Corinthians, uh, from, from the book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, excuse me. Uh, and it's really almost impossible to have a missions conference without somebody getting into 2 Corinthians 8 and talking about the Macedonians and their abundant giving. Well, the whole context of the Macedonians and their abundant giving is given right here in Romans 15. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Now, let's set the scene just for a moment. Okay, because back in that day, when the church began, none of us were in it. I'm not just saying because it was a long time ago. There were no Gentiles in the church. The church was a Jewish church. The Lord was Jewish, the apostles were Jewish, and the entire church was Jewish. Today, we have people who say, do you really think the Jews should be allowed in the church? Which is a bizarre question, because back in that day, they were saying, do you really think we ought to let Gentiles in the church? Uh, it was a big question. And God directly intervened and said, you know what? You're going to have to let those Gentiles in. Salvation is also for the Gentiles. Praise God for that. Uh, and so the church said, okay, we'll let the Gentiles in. And the church began to spread beyond the, beyond the Jewish people. And Gentiles began to get saved as well. And we ended up in a day when the Apostle Paul was traveling around the world ministering. 
And he got news back from Judea that the saints there, the believers there, were living in great need. There was a famine in the land. The people were terribly poor. And so Paul began to talk to the Gentiles in other cities and say, listen, listen, you guys, you have received from them the word of God. You have received from them the Bible and the gospel. It wouldn't be a bad idea if in return you gave to them material things. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contribution for the poor saints which are to Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. He's saying, you know what? You Gentiles are debtors. Through the Jews, you have received the word of God. Through the Jews, you have received Messiah. Through the Jews, you have received the gospel. If you have received spiritual riches from them, isn't it, wouldn't it just be right that you could give materially to help out those poor saints there in Israel? And that's a story we all know. We know about the Macedonians' reaction that though they lived in, in deep poverty, they gave beyond their ability, gave themselves also to that work, to be able to help the, the material needs of those folks. Today, the situation is somewhat different. I'm not asking you to contribute materially to the needs of the poor saints in Jerusalem, but I want us to think about this. The gospel started there. The word of God, Messiah, the gospel, it came through the Jewish people. And today, I tell you, the Gentiles, that there's a great famine there among the Jewish people. Not a physical famine, not a famine of food and material, but a famine of the word of God. And I think that if Paul were here today, he would say to them, wouldn't it be right since you've received great spiritual blessings from them? In that day, it was to give back materially. But today it is, you received from them the gospel. Don't you think it's time that we return to the gospel to them? That we return the favor that we gave back, that we paid back by taking the gospel back to the Jewish people. There's another verse here where he says, not that you would be made poor and they would be made rich, but that there would be an equality. Sometimes people say, why is it you want to preach only to the Jews? I've never said that. We preach to anybody that we can preach to, Jew or Gentile, with great joy. Okay, we're not asking that you make that something special. We're saying, let's make it an equality. We already share the gospel with the Gentiles. Let's make it an equality where we are also sharing it with God's chosen people, the Jewish people. This is something that we need to do. Some people say, you know what? Jewish people don't really actually ever get saved. And that's not true. But I understand the doubt that you sometimes have. I was sitting in my office in Tel Aviv. I was working feverishly because, I don't know if you're like this, but before we travel, there's always 1,000 things that have to be done. And we're working like madmen going almost around the clock trying to get everything done before we travel. And we were about 36 hours away from getting on an airplane to fly back to America. We had a trip planned to come back to America for some things. And so we were working feverishly to, to, to get everything finished. And my phone rang. Happy moment. And I picked up the phone and said, hello. It was the president of our mission board. And he, now he had formerly served in South Africa as a missionary. And uh, he called me. He said, Sam, how are you doing? I said, I'm great. I'm busy, but I probably won't tell you that. Uh, and he said, I just got a call from South Africa. There's a lady there in South Africa. And, and her name is Miranda. And many years ago, she was at the hospital. Her husband was sick. She was at the hospital. And as she waited in the waiting room, there was a lady next to her whose husband was also sick. And they began to share. And this lady's name was Estelle. And, and Estelle is Jewish. And her husband was sick. And Miranda and Estelle became friends as they waited for their husbands in the hospital. And they, they became acquainted. They became friends. And Miranda, who is a, a believer, began to witness to Estelle and talk to her about Jesus. But Estelle said, no, you know what? That's not for me. I'm Jewish. And she said, I'm not interested. But they remained friends. And this has gone on for years and years and years that Miranda has witnessed to Estelle, has prayed for her, has loved her. But Estelle has never been willing to accept the gospel. 
Now, the reason I'm calling you, Brother Frampton said to me, he said, is that Estelle then immigrated, her husband passed away, she immigrated to Israel. She's living in Israel. She's very sick. And Miranda is no longer, Estelle can barely talk now. And it's, Miranda is no longer able to communicate with her by telephone. And she's desperate that someone would take her the gospel. And so Miranda knew me, called me and said, do you know anybody in Israel? And he said, I know Sam. And he said, Sam, could you go visit Miranda? And I said, no problem. It's 36 hours before the airplane. I got nothing to do. Sure. I didn't say any of that. I said, of course, I'd be glad to do that. And uh, so I got in my car, and I have to tell you, my faith was small, because as I'm driving across the country, thankfully it's a small country, as I'm driving across the country to the city where she lives, I'm thinking, okay, Miranda has witnessed to this lady for decades, has loved her, has prayed for her for decades, and so this guy that she's never met is going to walk in and say, hi, don't you want to receive Jesus? And of course, she's going to fall to her knees and repent, right? Sure. Right. Well, whatever. I can share the gospel. At least I can do that. That way nobody would throw rocks at me. And so I went in there to talk to that lady. And she was very ill. And I shared Christ with her. I went through the Old Testament scriptures and showed her that the, that the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, the Tanakh, shows beyond a shadow of a doubt who Messiah is. And I got to the end of it and I said, Miranda, excuse me, Estelle, I said, tell me According to the Tanakh, who is Messiah? I nearly fell off my chair. She looked at me and barely able to speak. She croaked out, Jesus is Messiah. And I said, would you like to receive him as your savior? And that day, Estelle bowed her head and received Christ and was born again. We saw an incredible change in her life. We have trouble getting Baptists to read the Bible, but that Jewish lady, she couldn't read. Her eyes were gone. She had, her vision was completely shot. She couldn't see. So I brought her an audio Bible, and she insisted every day to her caretakers, turn on that audio tapes. I want to listen to the New Testament at least an hour every day as she got into the Word of God. Estelle got wonderfully saved. Folks, there is a remnant. God is saving souls. In 1948, they counted, and there were 23 Jewish believers in Israel. Today, 20,000. God is doing a work and Jewish people are being, being saved. And as it was in that day when Paul said, shouldn't we give to their material needs? I'd say to, to you, there are Jewish people all around us in Israel, here in Atlanta. Shouldn't we return to them after all that we've received from them? Please stand with me once more. Who, O oh Lord, could save themselves, their own souls could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea, your grace. alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave, you came down to find us, let us out of death, to you alone belongs the highest praise. from the grave find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise you alone can rescue you alone
alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. You may be seated. Future missionaries, amen? All right, I'm so glad that you're getting to enjoy all that God has prepared for us. We have two of our own, everybody just about has been in, that you've had this week in the conference is one of ours, either are members of Vision or they're working with Vision Baptist Missions or they, came, they claim us as a church home and so we thank the Lord for that. But, to that, but right now you're going to hear from two of our staff people. Miguel Sanabri is going to come. Miguel is, uh, was our Spanish pastor, still is our Spanish pastor for another week. And then he will be on his way going out and preaching across the, uh, across the country, raising his support. And uh, we love him and are blessed by him. He has done a tremendous job. He is actually the first person saved at Vision. And he has come up all the way through our training. And he has... Uh, I've been discipled here and discipled others and led our Spanish ministry, and it's a great privilege to have him come and preach for us right now. Brother Miguel Sanabria. Everyone would please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, um, and uh, please have your finger there. Everyone in this world is seeking happiness, especially Colombians. If you look at their history, for more than half a century now, the people of Colombia have been in war against Guerrillas have been in war against, drug cartels have been in war against organized crime. For years, the people of Colombia have been trying to find peace, to find happiness. If you look at their history, the word paz will come along pretty often because that's what they seek. For years and years and years, they have not had it. The problem is that the peace that they've been trying to find is the wrong type of peace. It's peace with robbers, peace from robbers, peace from kidnappers, peace from organized crime. As you all know, I wasn't born here, and I think you can tell by my accent and by the way I look. I was born in Colombia, and uh, I grew up all around the violence. Uh, I remember one night I was waking up at around 2 a.m., and the house was shaking. And you might think, well, that's an earthquake. Uh, the reality is that uh, two blocks down from where we live, there's a military station. And what they would do, the guerrillas would come to Bogota, and they would throw bombs or hydrogen tanks to the station so that they would ex make it explode. And so you, you could hear, you, could, you can wake up from the shaking. I grew up with uh, checking my pockets uh, and looking behind my back every five seconds. My wife uh, gets frustrated and makes fun of me sometimes because we live in a third floor apartment and when we're all the way down, I'm like, did I remember to lock my door? One second, I gotta go back upstairs. And she's like, come on, you do this all the time. And so that's something that stuck with me in my head because of what I lived in Colombia. 
I grew up in a country where getting kidnapped, robbed, and assassinated, it was news of every single day. I grew up in a country full of violence. At the age of, of 13, my family uh, decided to uh, take, a, take a rough decision. I remember how I was hearing of many families fleeing the country and coming to the United States seeking asylum because of what was going on uh, in Colombia. My parents then decided to make a, uh, make a rough decision, a tough decision. They decided that my mother and my brother and I would come here to find peace from all that was going on. And you might be thinking, wow, they finally find peace uh, by coming here, but that is very far from the truth. A lot of Colombians think that coming here, they will find peace from violence. Coming here, they, they might find peace from, from the robbing and all the violence. But the truth is that the only peace that everyone needs is peace with God. And when I came here, I did not have that. In Colombia, people think that by fleeing their current situation in place, that they will find peace in their lives. That when they come to the United States, that all their problems would be solved. That there would be no more problems in their lives. That by coming here, that they will be find happiness and money. They will finally find the happiness that they will, they've been looking for for more than 50 years. But that is so far from the truth. And that is what my family and I thought when we came here. And we came here thinking, man, all our problems are going to be solved. My mother, my brother, and I were thinking this is going to be the greatest thing. But the truth was very far from that. The truth was that my family was broken. The reason why you saw my mom standing here by herself is because coming here broke my family apart. We thought that we were going to find happiness. We thought that we were going to find uh, great opportunities. And we did. But the peace, the happiness did not come along with that. Beside all that happened, God is still good, and God will always be good. I came here looking for different things. I came here looking for money, but what I found was Christ. At the age of 15, uh, thanks to missionaries that came from Peru, they came and shared the gospel with me, and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we find this one verse that is always stuck in my mind. It's constantly telling me and showing me how people come here finding, trying to find peace, trying to find happiness, but the only peace, the only happiness that they can find, them, they will only find the only true peace is with God. And it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. My wife and I, we found peace here. My wife and I, we, we, we've been happy here, not because of how the United States work, not because of the money that we, we, we have here, but we found peace here because of the, the Bible and what it says, the truth that it proclaims to us about how we can have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please pray for my family and I as we go back to the country of Colombia, a place that's been heartbroken for many years, a place where they don't have peace, that they think that they have to flee the country and go somewhere else to find peace and happiness. Please pray for us as we go and tell them that the only peace, that the only happiness that they need it's with God, and they'll only find it in the Bible. Thank you. Well, Miguel has been a blessing to our church, and I thank God for him. Also, we have a deacon in our church. His name is Micah Rosselli. Micah, uh, Micah uh, has been a blessing to me. He's been a blessing to our entire church. He has uh, honestly been what I would have dreamed of. For a deacon, he started as a deacon very young. I'm very proud of him, and now he's on his way to Bosnia. No better way to lose a deacon, amen. Reminds me of those deacons in the New Testament. One of them got killed, and one of them became a preacher. Just preach, amen. If you would open your Bible to the Book of Matthew, and we'll be in uh, chapter number seven. On Friday, I talked about a young man by the name of Kenan, and I told a little bit of his story. His story is a lot longer than what I said, um, but. It, while reading through the book, I noticed Kenan. Uh, Kenan is a Bosniak, which is the, four, the group of the Bosnians that would be Muslim. And, uh, but he was not a devout Muslim. When the war broke out and he was fight, they were fighting and his family was going through all the persecution they were going through, in the book he writes and he says, I wondered why this was happening to us. He says, I wasn't even a, a good Muslim. I had only been to mosque one time in my entire life. By the age of 12, he had only been to mosque one time, and that wasn't even with his parents. He had never gone with his parents. He did not know the Quran. He could not read the Quran, and he had no idea what he said. 
The one rule his family did keep is they never ate pork. But the reason his dad gave him wasn't that the Quran said they couldn't. It was that pigs are nasty animals, so we don't eat them, is what his dad said was the reason for not eating pork. Today I want to talk a little bit, and I want you to see the hope that they can have that is in Bosnia for the people there. There are three main religions in the country of Bosnia, and as I spoke on Friday, it's separated pretty much by nationality. You have the Serbians, who are all mostly going to be Orthodox. You have the Bosniaks in Bosnia, and they will be Muslim. And then you have the Croatians, which are going to be Catholics, and they, they are most of the population fit in those categories. From everything I can read and from those Bosnians I know here, they're not very religious. They claim to be Bo Muslim, they claim to be Orthodox, but they don't even know what their church teaches, and they're not true uh, believers in their churches. But I want you to see what the hope would be if they were to fully commit themselves to the, to the religions that they claim to be. If they were Orthodox or Catholic, Catholic, they teach that you have to follow the seven sacraments of the faith. And those seven sacraments are how they gain eternal life. It's not by faith, even though they will say it is by faith, but then they add to their faith, they add all of these works. For Catholics and Orthodox, they have to be baptized. That's the first step in their salvation, is baptism. Not faith, but baptism. And they even do that as a baby. If you're Serbian, you'll be dipped into water, and if you're Catholic, you'll have water sprinkled on you. And that's their first step into, into salvation, they say they say. Then they go through these other steps, which would be confirmation. They have Eucharist or Mass, which is where they take part of the Lord's body, and they actually believe that the bread and the wine turn into Christ's body, and that they receive Christ as Savior every time that they are accepting the Mass. Then they would do penance, where they go before a priest or before the church, and they, they tell them all of their sins, trying to find forgiveness. They will anoint the sick with oil, they'll follow the holy orders, and then they must get married. To be a good Catholic or a good Serbian Orthodox, you must get married. To stay single means that you have not kept one of the seven sacra sacraments of the faith. The same is almost true for the Muslims, so they do not follow seven sacraments. I know many of you might know this, but they have five pillars of the faith, and they have to keep these rules. Both religions are full of rules. The five rules that a Muslim will keep is he will first he'll confess that Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet. Then he'll sit down and he has to pray five times a day. And it's not prayers like we pray where we just talk to God. They have set prayers that they have to say at specific times. Then he must give his money to the poor. He must fast during Ramadan and he must visit Mecca. All of these things they think will get them eternal life. When I was in Morocco a few years ago and I spoke with a young man by the name of Khalid, and I had shared the gospel with him, and we had talked back and forth about Islam and about Christianity, and I tried to share Christ with him, and he had rejected it. And one day I asked him shortly before coming back, I said, Khalid, if you were to do everything that Islam says, and if you were to believe it all and you were to live a perfect life according to the Quran, would you know you're going to heaven? And he looked at me and he says, no. He said, in Islam, there's no guarantee of eternal life. He said, Allah has the power to tell you whether you go to heaven or hell. And the truth is, he said, you could live a horrible life and Allah says, I want you. And you could be the best Muslim and Allah says, I don't want you go to hell. So his hope, he had no hope. No matter what he did, he had no idea where he would spend his eternity. Both of these, all three of these religions teach that we get to God by our work. Works, but we here in this room, we know that that's not true. We know that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, not our works. In Titus chapter number 3 and verse 5, we know that it's not by works of righteousness which he, we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. We know that it is by God's work, by Christ's work on the cross, that we can have eternal life. It's not ours. But the people in Bosnia, for the most part, do not know that. And they either they think, well, I'm Serbian Orthodox, so I'm going to heaven because that's what I am. Or they think that they are doing enough good works to make their way to heaven, but neither one of those are enough. And here in Matthew chapter number 7, I, wanted, I want you to see a conversation that one day will happen with all of them before God. And this is what will happen, whether they be in Islam or an Orthodox or a Muslim or Catholic. And Jesus is talking to Israelites, and Israelites are full of religion. And he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many mighty works. And I want you to notice what Jesus' response to them is. His response is, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The people in Bosnia and many people even around us in Alpharetta and in coming, someday they will stand before God and they will say, God, have we not been baptized? Have we not prayed? Have we not done many mighty works? Have we not even given to the poor and given to others and lived sacrificial lives or done great things? And Jesus Christ will look at them and he will say, I never knew you. And he'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And they will go to an eternity of hell, and their end is the lake of fire where they burn for eternity. And this is the truth for most of the people in Bosnia. And this is even the truth for many of the people around us and our neighbors. And this should cause our hearts to break knowing that the end of the world and the end of these religions is not heaven, and it is not God. And even though their hope is thinking, I will earn my way to God, God is looking back and he's saying, believe in my son, because if you don't believe, I will say, I never knew you. Please pray for Catherine and I that we'd be able to get to Bosnia quickly so that they might be known by Jesus. So that when they stand before him one day, God will say, I know you, you are mine, and come and live with me. Let's sing together one more. Stand with me. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Tiller, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, hearts always hunger for almighty infinite father faithfully loving your own here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne oh we're falling for your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger thank you very much. You can have a seat. If I'm not mistaken, I see Carla Stevens back there. How about stand up Carla? She used to be a member of our church and she is from Wisconsin. (laughs) Oh, that's a step up. You can come on down here and you'll be better off. Amen. Glad you're here. Glad to see her. She was here back a long time ago and we thank the Lord for her. In just a few minutes, you'll hear from Daniel Sparks. Daniel is a missionary to Chile. God is using him raising his support. I'm very proud of him, and I want you to listen carefully as he preaches in just a second. 
But before that, if you don't have one of these faith promise cards, would you hold your hand up? Some people come in after Sunday school, and they might not yet have a card. If you don't have one, right over here, Chris needs one. Anybody else? Up here on the front, Mary Angela, we need these missionaries to give. Amen? And back there in the back, Jared needs one. Anybody else? Hold your hand up. There's one right back here. The Maddox says, please help me there. Right, okay, right over here. There you go. And back in the back, did y'all take care of that? Thank you so much. Now listen to me. Still need one in the back, guys. Right back over there in front of Josh. There you go. Anybody else that doesn't have one? Now let me explain to you what this is. As Christians, we want to be givers. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good me- with the same measure you give, it will be given back to you. God blesses us as we become givers. And God wants us to give towards his work. We want to give towards his work because we're saved. And we know that. And we're thankful for it. And so the way God's word gets around the world is not by some compulsory obligation that you feel, but because your heart says, I love Jesus, I love people, I want the world to know about Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, so you're giving here to support our church, and you do a good job, you take good care of our church. Lord willing, within a little over a year, we'll be moving into our own building a year and a month or two from now. Uh, we should be into our own building, Lord willing, and uh, we are, we've met all of our needs for 10 years. We have never had any, honestly, we've never had financial issues. We have uh, 370 or 80000 in the bank towards getting our new uh, building built. We'll hit 500000 before we start building, Lord willing, and uh, we're just, God has blessed. But we've also given $1.2 million away. And as a church, we have given, so I know God will give to us too, and he'll bless us, and he has. But as you take this card, what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to pray about what you and your family can give. And in a minute, Brother John will come up and do the offering devotional, and, when, and you'll, you'll tear off this part right here, and you'll, you'll write on here what you're going to give, and that you'll turn in, and you'll write on this so you'll remember, and you stick it in your Bible, and you'll give X amount of money every week. Every kid in the room ought to be giving. Every child. I do not remember when I started giving. My parents taught me to be a giver when I was small. My son David was the last one, the barbon, the one of the, bar, uh, the beard. Uh, he, he, uh, when he was little, he learned to get a faith promise, and he was always so funny. We'd have faith promise conference just like this at the Hunter Church. David was maybe seven or eight, and David would come up to me after Sunday morning when we gave our promise. He'd say, Dad, we need to talk. And I'd say, okay, buddy, what do we need to talk about? He said, I upped my faith promise. And I said, well, that's great, buddy. And he said, so I'm going to need a raise in my allowance. <laughs> I said, that sounds like you're asking me to believe God and not you to believe God. He said, I'm believing God to touch your heart. <laughs> and so, but you want to learn to be a giver, amen? So write down here what you'd give. And today's number probably won't be all that it will be. Missionaries that we support, our, they give through our church, and they'll be sending in their faith promise. And so we will be giving again this year. So I want you to listen to Daniel as he comes. Then when Brother John comes and does the offering devotional, you throw these in the offering plate, and they will be counted, and we'll know uh, something about what we're, what we're giving. And then over the next couple of weeks, the, all the tallies will come in, and we'll see what God is going to do through our church. I love Daniel Sparks. I'm very proud of him. Very proud of his family. You listen as he comes and preaches to us. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12. The book of Romans, chapter 12. We're just going to be in the first two verses of Romans, chapter 12. I'll give you a little history behind the book of Romans. Paul wrote the book to the church at Rome who he had never seen before. He had never seen these people, but he had joy in his life. He put Jesus first, others second, and himself dead last. So he wrote 16 chapters to, to this church just to love them and encourage them. And, and we're looking here in, the, in Romans chapter 12. It starts the a second part of the, the book here on how to behave in the Christian life. I don't think any of us have ever arrived yet on how to behave in the Christian life, and we, we can all learn something here from the book of Romans. Right here, we'll dissect the, the, uh, the, these two verses here. It starts out, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, the word beseech here means to beg, to urge, 
or exhort or encourage. So he's encouraging these people, and he calls them brethren. They're his brothers and sisters in Christ. He wanted to see them face to face. He wanted to minister to him, and now he's encouraging them, to his fellow believers. So Paul's going to encourage them on, on their Christian way, how to behave as Christians. Uh, when people come to church, as I said uh, two nights ago, that some people can't smile when they come to church, and I don't understand that. They don't get excited. But a lot of times, um, I, I learned a long time ago maybe to quit asking people how they're doing, all right? I, normally, I don't ask anybody unless they're excited, and, and I hope they're excited about Jesus, and I want to be around people that are exciting. So when someone comes to you at church especially and says, hey, how are you? They don't need to hear about all your dirty laundry and how horrible your life is. We as Christians should be like Paul and encourage people. We should say, God is good and, and he's great. I mean, I know there's, there's horrible things in your life and prayer requests, time and everything, but we should be edifying each other and building and encouraging other people. So do you encourage other Christians? Moving on here, the next part says, uh, he says he does these things by the mercies of God. Mercy, a, a, another word for that is compassion. He said, I have compassion for you. I love you. I, I want to encourage you. I think about Jesus Christ himself, the most compassionate, most selfless person ever to walk on the face of the earth, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He went to people and talked to them that, didn't, that didn't, uh, no one else wanted to go to. And he went to them because he loved them. He had mercy for them and compassion. We should, we should show the same. Uh, Jude 22 says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. That there's people growing up, I saw the video in Chile, people want to make a difference in their life. And you know, the Bible says the, the way to make a difference is to love people, to have compassion for people. You know, I, I'm, I'm a preacher, and I, I know I'm not a good preacher, and I, and I don't ever strive to be the great preacher, but you know something I can do? I can have compassion for people. I can love people. I can, I can invest in people's lives, and that's what I want to do with my life, especially in the country of Chile. Uh, the next part of the verse, it says that you present. The word here, present, means to take a stand. There are people all over the world today in our country that are taking a stand for things that aren't godly, that are not biblical. And God's children, the fellow believers, we have to take a stand on God's word and his promises, or we're going to fall for anything. We need to stand on God's word and his promises. The next part it says here, your body a living sacrifice. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and should be used to serve. Uh, God didn't save us to sit on a pew or sit in a chair. He saved us to serve. He saved us to, to, get, to come to church, and that's a great, great thing that you're here at church today. And uh, in, in, in Sunday school and in morning, maybe you come on Sunday night when, and Thursday night as well. But you know what? The way we serve is when we get outside those doors what people see us, and, and we should encourage people in here and fellowship with believers, but we need to serve Christ outside those doors. And there's a lot of churches that get excited about services. I hope you're excited. I'm excited and encouraged from this missions conference, but it shouldn't stop here. When we get out there, there we need to be a light in this world that we live in. If they, people don't see us as Christians with the light, they're going to turn to anything else, and we need to be true lights in this world. The next part of the verse, it says, uh, just one word, holy. Here, holy means dedicated. Christ, God said himself, I am holy. Be holy for I am holy. We're to live holy, dedicated lives to Christ. Um, believe it or not, you're somebody's favorite Christian, whether you know it or not. Everywhere you go, somebody's watching you at home. My wife and kids are watching me. And kids, they're, they're, their brains, their brains, their minds are like sponges. They soak up everything they hear and see. And I want to be as real at home and out in the world as I am here in the pulpit this morning. We should want to be real and dedicate our lives to Christ. The next part, it says acceptable to God. The word acceptable here means pleasing. Is God pleased with your life? Is he getting all that he paid for? You've been bought with a price. We're to glorify God in everything that we do with our lives. Um, if I go to Walmart or some store and I buy something and I'm not pleased with it, I can return it. Praise the Lord. Jesus doesn't want to return any of us. We've been bought with a price, but is he pleased with his purchase? Is he getting all that he paid for? He wants you to serve God. He wants you to love him. He wants you to go to the, beyond, the regions beyond if that's, if, that's, if that's the will of God in your life. And, and obviously here, uh, they, that's preached a lot. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. The next part here, it says, uh, now, these things that I just read in this verse, it says, these things are your reasonable service. Another way of saying reasonable service would be your true nature of worship. As Christians, we receive a new nature. We're a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away, and, and because we have a new nature, then, then we're to... Um, 
I'm sorry. Then we're to um, be true in our worship. So coming to church is not the, the worship Paul's talking about here. These people, he was writing to Christians. They were already coming to church, and he said, your worship is service. Your true way of worship is getting out those doors and telling other people about Jesus, serving each other and serving an unsaved world. We have to uh, serve an unsaved world. Each person at church has a ministry uh, at church and, uh, and maybe somewhere else, as our family is going to Chile, that you're expected to fulfill. Everybody should have a job done at church. Whatever it is you're doing, maybe you're doing something, maybe you're not, uh, you're, already, uh, you're not doing anything. Everybody should be serving in the local assembly here at this church. Um, the next part, Romans, uh, the next verse here, uh, the first one here we just learned about what we're to do. God saved us. Uh, we gave our hearts to Christ. But then he says, Paul says, hey, church, it doesn't stop there. We're to give our bodies a living sacrifice uh, to God. So uh, we, need to, we need to do that. And the next part here, it talks about our mind. Uh, the, the verse here says, and be not conformed to this world. So conform means to shape one's behavior. You know, when we get saved, we get that new nature. nature. We're not to be like the world anymore. Every day we're to be less and less like the world. And, and we should, uh, the next part of it here, it says, but, ye, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do we be, get away from the world? We got to be transformed. We got to be changed. People have to see a difference in us for them to want what we have. And, and you're somebody's favorite Christian. They ought to see a difference in you. You might be the reason why someone will come to Christ one day. Because who else do they have to look at? You have family that's lost. You've got friends that's lost. We live in a world that, is, that the majority of them's lost and have never heard the gospel before. How are they going to get saved unless we, the church, get serious to reach our world and reach our community with the gospel? Uh, the last part here, well, I just said uh, what's, uh, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We heard it a lot about the perfect will in your life. Uh, right here, approve means to test or approve, and the will means a desire or a purpose. So the last question I have is, what is your purpose in life? Is uh, I want to be like Paul. And in Philippians 1.21, he said, uh, for me to live is Christ. From a Roman jail cell, he wrote that he said, everything about me I breathe is Jesus. Everything I want to do, I want to come minister to y'all in Philippi. I want to minister to people. But you know what? If God took my life here in this jail today, you know what? It's really gain. Everything I did, you know why? Because I get to go to heaven and meet Jesus. But while he was on earth, even in a Roman jail cell, he was ministering to people. He was loving people. He was witnessing to people. He was telling everybody how good God is. So none of us are in jail here this morning. We should all have a, good, a great story and testimony of how good God's been in our life. And we need to uh, share that with everybody because we're the light in the world and everybody needs to hear it. I pray that everybody finds their perfect will, as the, as the end of this verse says, the perfect will. How do you find the perfect will for your life? You have to study God's word. All right, I, there's a lot of people that come, want to be preachers or want to teach in Sunday school and do ministry at church, but they can't even be faithful to church. I don't understand that. We've got to be faithful to church. We've got to study God's word, and we have to act like God. You know, the word Christian means Christ-like or a small Christ, so we have to act like Christ. Every day, our, uh, our main goal in life should be acting more like Jesus, more compassion, more love and want to reach the world. And also, we have to renew our mind. Our mind, our bodies, we have to present as living sacrifices, and we have to have a new mind and say, you know what? I'm going to live for Christ. I'm not going to live for this world anymore and, and have a new mind. And, and there is no magical way to know the will of God apart from knowing God's word. And I encourage everybody to study God's word, stay around this church and Brother Austin, and, and you will soon find God's perfect will for your life. And, and when you find it, you'll be like me and not dreading maybe getting up out of bed every morning, but getting up and saying, I bless God, I get to serve God today. I get to serve him with my life. What a honor and privilege. And by the way, when he does that, I've, I've never been more blessed in the past year plus on deputation, seeing God's hand on our lives and just protection. And, and he's a good God. And he wants people to be in the center of the, of, of the will for their life, but God's way and not our own desires. We should all desire that as Christians. Thank you. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. You've heard some great teaching on faith promise, why you should be involved in faith promise. You've been given an opportunity now to get involved in faith promise. And uh, Austin asked me to talk about the blessings of faith promise. And the blessings of faith promise for me is a very personal story. And so I'm going to start it out by reading to you a text that I sent to uh, Austin while I was down in Peru 
uh, with the high school class back in July, I said, I will get to teach the Bible to Peruvians tonight in Spanish. I can't write that without getting emotional. Thank you for the huge parts you played in making that possible. Too many ways to count. Thank you. That's the story of, that's really the story of the blessings of faith promise in my life. We were in Peru, sitting with Peruvian friends in buildings that we had built together, and I was getting ready to teach the Bible in Spanish because Matthew 6.21 says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart, will your heart be also. I didn't been, been investing treasure over there for years, for a lot of time. My heart followed, now my heart, body, and treasure are all in the same place, and what a blessing that was. All of that was the result of Faith Promise. It all began in a missions conference about 32 years ago when I learned about Faith Promise for the first time. Brother Dean Hamby was in that missions conference 32 years ago, and he stood um, Jason and Julie up on, a, up on the uh, piano stool, and they sang, I know what I'll do, I'll take it to Jesus. And I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And I don't think I really thought much about anything outside of Georgia or the rest of the world in those days. I really wasn't thinking about the world. I really wasn't thinking about the impact of Faith Promise. I just thought that my giving could help their going, and that would be a really great thing. And so like the verse said, my heart soon followed the treasure that I put in missions. It's not just about giving so that the gospel can get to other people. It's about scattering your treasure all over the world and letting your heart be willing to follow that treasure, partnering up with all that God is doing around the world. It's almost impossible to get involved in faith promise and then your heart not follow that and you want to go visit that. I think our membership card has a checkbox on it. Do you have a passport? Do your children have a passport? You might as well get used to that around here. You may argue, well, I can give to faith promise a little bit, but I can't afford to travel around the world. Well, I watched 11 teenagers raise $2,000 last year, and if you need any help, they will be willing to help you and teach you how to do that. It's not hard if you want to go. I got a call last night. It was interesting. We were getting ready to eat, and David Gardner was singing on the, we had a David Gardner uh, CD playing, and he called me. And I thought, what did we do, violate a copyright or something? And he <laughs> found out. He's calling me. And he called me to tell me that they had withdrawn all the money that day to give to Pablo Villegas for the church, La Victoria. It was really kind of interesting because that was the church that Brother Dean talked about going to and then going back to Brother Ronald Tobias used to be the pastor there, and you got to meet him last night, him coming back to that church, and now Vision had raised $8,000 to send down to Pablo's church, and we got to be there and present that gift to him, and he was actually going to get the money today in his church to make that church even greater than it is. This is about the blessings of faith promise. It leads to so many wonderful things. Sandy and I aren't missionaries and probably never will be. But we see ourselves as friends and partners of missionaries all around the world and of so many things that God is doing. I learned Spanish to teach the Bible to people I met in Peru. On mission trips, I took to see the work of friends that I first met as missionaries that I got the opportunity to meet through Faith Promise. So if you want to know how big a vision you can have for Faith Promise, this verse will tell you how to do it. For where your treasure is, there will your heart, will your heart be also. Maybe you can't visualize yourself doing that, but don't underestimate the power of that verse. This is one of the biggest things we'll ever do in our life. Let's not do it in a small way. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the power of Matthew 6, 21. And I pray, Lord, this morning that we would, beyond our anything we ever contemplated, get involved in missions, that we would get involved in faith promise, and that, Lord, you would work the promises of that verse in our life. And Father, you would let us see wonderful things happen through our church, through the ministry, through ourselves, through our giving, and most of all, Lord, through your power. And we'll praise you and thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. salvation behold the wonder of grace so free behold the blessing of true
perfect healing at Calvary. Come and see, come and see what God has done. Come and see, come and see what love has won in this place. Hearts and lives waking up to the light of the world. You're the light of the world. Your cross is speaking. Words of freedom, no condemnation. Shall we now fear our shame is silence? Your love is triumph at Calvary. Come and see, come and see what God has done. I don't even enjoy seeing what God has done. Say amen. amen. He has been very good to this little church, and I sure appreciate how good he is and pray. He is the director, assistant director of Macedonia World Baptist Missions. He's been my friend for right at 29 years. That's when I met him, and I have praised the Lord for him and his work, and he's been a blessing to us. You're going to enjoy this message. Thank you, brother. Amen. I appreciate Brother Austin and his wife Elizabeth and their family. <laughs> what well, has just been a special time, and I, I don't know how to tell you thank you for letting me be here. It's been good. Amen. It has been good. And we weren't able to make it last year. Karen has a real heart problem, hard heart and all that. and So we weren't able to make it last year. She was in the hospital, but uh, I think in God's great great wisdom and planning he allowed us to be here uh, today this week and how good it's been and uh, I'm just uh, it's I've counted an honor and a privilege to be here and stand in this pulpit and get to see all of you and and to see old friends and make new friends it's just been a blessing thank you so much thank you for the accommodations that couldn't have been better I'm telling you first class I was telling Brother Jesse, we've stayed in, in rat-infested places and cockroach-infested places and, and uh, places where you didn't really want to lay on the bed. But I tell you, we have thoroughly enjoyed where we have been, uh, and it's just been great. Every meal, the steaks, oh my goodness, and the, I had to cut the baked potato in half and share it, and everything that we've had has just been special. International, you don't find a better place to come if you want real international. <laughs> I mean, authentic everything. It was wonderful. Everything, the songs and all. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I appreciate Brother Ed letting me pick on him. And um, I had a bot. My bodyguard was going to beat you up today because I told him you'd been picking on me. So 
but I appreciate everything you've done for us. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter number 15. Uh, we've been in the Old Testament for uh, the last few nights, but this morning we're going to, to Luke chapter 15, a very familiar portion of Scripture, three, uh, I think, three essential parables that you find in the Word of God in this chapter. Um, we're only going to read a few verses uh, to bring the message this morning because I'm excited to get to see what the faith promise is going to be. So looking forward to that. I appreciate Brother John and his wife Sandy and, and their girls. I appreciate what the Lord has, has used them to do over these many years. A heart. You don't find a bigger heart uh, than, uh, than John and Sandy. And I appreciate God using them in, in a great, great and mighty way. Only heaven will reveal what, what you have done. Only heaven can reveal, honestly, what you have done and, and um, what's uh, going on around the world because we're too finite to comprehend the lives that are being touched even today that go beyond even your personal abilities. It goes, it goes so much farther than that. It's like a tree where the roots, you don't see the roots. You don't see how far the roots go. But I'm glad they go a long ways and they go deep. Praise the Lord. Well, let me ask you to stand one more time. That'll give you just a moment. I know the pews are padded, but you know what? I think there's metal or something underneath there because my, my um, uh, I guess I could say my backside, it found the bottom of it somewhere down there. <laughs> but, uh, let'll give you just a moment to, re to relax. Verse number one, the Bible says, Then drew near unto him the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine of the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost." I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And let's pray. Father, our hearts are just filled to overflowing this morning as we think about all you're doing. And Father, we're just so glad that we can have a small part in this great and eternal work of God. And I pray that you'll bless this congregation of folks. I, I know they're praying, they're searching, and, and Lord, they want to do something to reach one person for the gospel, with the gospel of Christ and for the cause of Christ. And so I pray that right now you'll just give clear direction. I pray that if there's one in our midst that doesn't know Christ as Savior, today would be that awesome, glad day that they'll find that peace. Uh, that, that Brother Miguel talked about, that so many, so many people, the world, all, all over the world, people are searching for peace, and they can't find peace except in one person, and that's Christ. And so I pray, if there's one today, whether it's here in this auditorium or in a class somewhere, that they'll find that peace today. So please have your way, and all that we do, may we honor you with our, li our lives and with our lips. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And you may be seated. You know, in verse number one of this chapter... Um, what a glorious thing. The Lord Jesus was there with, the, with the, the Pharisees and the scribes and he was talking to them. But in verse number one, we find that all of a sudden now here comes a different group of people. The off-scouring, the despised, the refused, the rejected. And all of a sudden the, the, the Pharisees uh, were having to make way for the publicans and sinners as they're coming. This whole chapter is based upon verse number two, the reason for these three parables. They're not, even though they're three different parables, there are three parables that make up a whole that talks about the lost sheep, the lost silver, and the lost son. They're all three that make up a whole. And all three of these parables have to do with the statement that's made in verse number two. And that, in, that verse, in verse number two, this was no, nothing short than an indictment against the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't said with honor and praise and glory, saying, oh, hallelujah, glory to God, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. That was not what this meant. This man, does he not know who these people are? This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them? This was an indictment against the Lord Jesus Christ. But can I tell you what it is for me? It is a glorious truth of the great love of God Amen. that He indeed does receive sinners and, and eats with them. And so I'm glad that based on that indictment against Him, the Lord Jesus wanted these men to understand that all are lost. 
And so in, this par- in these three parables, he's talking about lost things. And so what I, I love it is he makes it pertinent, just like the Lord Jesus wants to make it pertinent to me and you to understand that the world truly is indeed lost without a Savior. Makes it pertinent. We need to understand this morning, our next door neighbors all around the world, everybody has a soul and is precious to God, everyone. But the second thing he does, he makes it practical. Now, we've heard this week 7.4 billion, almost, you know, the, 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 the world population is exploded. And when I was born in 1952, 19, not 18, 1952, <laughs> the world population was 2.55 billion people. The world population has tripled in 63 years. Tripled. I don't understand that. 7.4, 7.5 it, it, billion people, it boggles my mind. We've heard about 1.4 billion people in one country, 1.2 billion in, in one country. I, I think about the world's largest Muslim country, uh, 2.5 billion, almost 2.6 billion. It, that just blows my mind. I can't figure that out. But you know what the Lord Jesus did? He made it practical. In these parables, he doesn't talk about a billion lost sheep and, a, and millions of lost sheep or millions. Of, he talks about one lost sheep, one lost piece of silver, one lost son. You know, I, I hope you understand that a Hamby's were not smart, but we are good looking, okay? Not smart. I, when I was up in Quebec, I said that all the time. Les Hambis sont tellement beaux, mais nous ne sommes pas tellement intelligents. And when Jason, when he came in and on the last service uh, that I was going to be there, I, I told Jason, I said, now listen, Jason, these folks, they have learned, I've taught, they've learned what great people. And so I said, les Hambis, or I'm going to say in English, the Hambis are, and everyone... Handsome, you know, so you, when I leave, if you don't understand anything else, you understand handsome. I started to say both, but handsome, we're handsome. Okay, I can understand one. I can understand, I can get that. One, one, one. And you know what I love this week? I, I love, brother, your, your video last night. Woo, wow. You know, Alex. You know what Alex is? He's one. Um, Caleb. Uh, he's one. We've heard about a lot of ones. We have saw pictures of one. And, and you know what? That's what it's all about. Just one. So he made it practical. You know what God wants? He wants you, one, to do something for one. That's what it's all about. It makes it practical. But thirdly, he makes it personal. He says in this parable, what man of you? Okay? These scribes and Pharisees are saying, they're murmuring, they're complaining. The Lord is eat, he's receiving sinners and he's eating with them. And Well, they don't even say Lord. They said this man, an indictment. But what man of you? If you had a lost sheep. Uh, what woman had a lost piece of silver? And there was a man that had two sons. He makes it personal. Can I tell you, this thing is personal. It's absolutely personal. And you know, one of the problems that we have is God wants that, that we're, all, we're all self-centered. It's my life. It's my family. But you know what happens? And I, I couldn't, have, couldn't have heard it any better, couldn't have said it any better uh, than what Brother John said a little bit ago. Can I tell you, when you begin to do... When you begin to give, your heart just goes out and all of a sudden it really does become personal. It, it makes a difference when you participate in a world that is dying and all of a sudden now somebody you've been praying for, somebody you've been giving the, mission, the money to for the missionary to go to and you hear about somebody getting saved, all of a sudden it becomes personal to you. Now, let me give you three thoughts and we'll be done. Number one, I want you to look with me in these verses of Scripture about the work for just one. Look at verse number four. It says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Can I tell you what the mentality of this world is today? Well, good grief, he's got ninety-nine. Why worry about the one that's lost? You know, everything's good on our side. Forget about the rest. That is the mentality, but I love this. You know, in the part of the, in the shepherd's work, there are three parts of this shepherd's work. Number word, number one, the first part of the shepherd's work was to go. You know, you're never going to get anywhere that you want to go unless you go. You got to take the first step. And so when the shepherd got up that day and he, he began to make his count of his hundred sheep, 
one sheep, two sheep, and I personally believe he knew all of them by name, and he's counting the sheep, all of a sudden now there's one missing. There's one that is gone. Um, when I look at this, I, I find something interesting. Look at this verse of Scripture. It says in that verse, verse number four, what man of you having a hundred sheep? Now look at this next part, these next four words, if he lose one. Would you look at the word lose for just a second? Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 6, the word of God tells me, all we like sheep, if you know the verse, all we like sheep have gone a what? Astray. Astray. Isaiah 53, verse number 6, puts the entire responsibility for the lostness of a man on the man. It's my, it was my, re I'm a sinner because I chose to be a sinner. I, cho I chose to walk away from God for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We're lost. We walked away from God. It's not God, it's us. But would you look at verse number 4 of chapter number 15? The Word of God says, if he lose one, if he lose one, it was our fault that we're lost. But can I tell you what this verse of Scripture is telling me? And glory to God for this. That God has taken upon himself the responsibility for the lostness of mankind. Because had he not done that, can I tell you what? This sheep would have remained lost. If he lose one, if he this, this sheep wasn't misplaced. Okay, I want you to know this sheep was lost and this sheep was ruined. This sheep would be forever lost had the shepherd not taken the responsibility for the lostness of that sheep. And that's why God so loved the world that he did give his only begotten son. He did send him into this world. That's why the Lord Jesus did voluntarily leave the glories of heaven and did come into this world and die upon that old rugged cross. He laid down his life. He gave his life. He took the responsibility. He could have said, yeah, I've got some, but I, I'm glad he said, i got a whole lot more I want to see saved. He took the responsibility for the lostness of mankind. And you know what he did? I love, I love the theme. This theme of this conference is beyond. The region's beyond. You know what he had to do? He had to go beyond where his, he was, beyond the sheepfold, beyond. He had to go beyond the comfort zone. He had to go to the regions beyond, maybe places where he had never been before. He had to go to the unknown, to the unsure, to find that which was lost. I like the second part of the, of the shepherd's work. It says, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after after that which, was, which is lost, now look at this now, until, until. I love that. You know what? That is the faithful part. So you have the first part. You know, if you've never given a faith promise, you ought to start today. There's got to be the starting point in your life. If you've never witnessed, you've never passed out a track, you've never won anybody got, you need to start. But I like this, I like this until. There's a lot of people that start, but they never finish. I, I like people, hmm. 29 years. I mean, he, he looks at me and he's, he says, you're just as ugly as you are the first time I ever saw it. I like people that 32 years, Brother John. I, I like people that when I, I see them, they're still in church. Amen. The Cofield kids and different ones I know around here. I like it. I like it until... You didn't just take a first step and then a second step. I'm glad he didn't take a hundred steps. You remember the story of Joseph? Do you know why Joseph ended up in Egypt? Do you know why? His father sent him on a mission. And he didn't stop after the first day or the second day. He didn't stop and say, you know what, I've looked, I've done my best, I'm going back to home to my father. I'm glad he went all the way until he found him. A man found him wandering in the wilderness, wandering around him, and he, he asked, have you seen my brother? Oh, here he goes. He ended up in Egypt because he went all the way until he found them, and they sold him into Egypt. Can I tell you what we got to do? We're going to have to go all the way. This thing is a continuous thing. It doesn't stop. It isn't, well, we've done enough, we've paid enough, we've given enough, we've witnessed enough, and so we can stop. There's no retirement in this thing. There's no time that, there's no place in our life where we, you know, I look at this old guy right here on the third row back here. Good night, what I know, Codger. You know, but you know what? I love the, I love the passion, brother. <laughs> that sounds like fresh passion. He may not have the, the vigor of a young man, but boy, he's got the drive of a young man. 
He's got the passion of a young man. I like it. I like it. And so he went until he found it. I, I like that faithful part, but I like the finished part. He went until he found it. Until he found it. He went and long, uh, far enough and he did the finished part. And we know the Lord Jesus, the word of God tells us in the book of John, chapter number 19, verse number, th uh, number 30, it is finished. And uh, aren't you glad those three words, it is finished, is not the cry of desperation and hopelessness and helplessness. Oh, I'm so glad that, that it's, the, it's the cry of victory. Um, there's a great old preacher that's gone on to be with the Lord, James, Dr. James Crumpton, that says... The words, the, the Greek words that the Lord Jesus spoke, they were the Greek words that a shepherd would cry out at the birth of a lamb or the farmer's cry at the harvest when it was bountiful or the warrior's cry when he came home from battle. Oh, I'm glad that we have a Savior today that finished the work on the cross of Calvary. And I want you to know this morning, the reason you are still here, the reason I am still here is because our work is not finished. He wants us to be faithful until and go and find and not be complacent and not be, never, be, come, never come to the point where we're satisfied that it's enough. The reason, if you're saved today, it's because somebody wasn't satisfied. But they were willing to pass out one more track. They were willing to knock on one more door. They were willing to preach one more message. They were willing to give one more dollar. They were never satisfied. And that's the reason we're all saved today is because somebody was still hungry until they could find that sheep which was lost. You know, somebody has said this, that the Heavenly Father bankrupt the coffers of heaven to send the Lord Jesus into this world. Our salvation is free, but can I tell you, it's absolutely not cheap. And you know what he did? He did this all for just one. Now you may brand me as a heretic, and that's okay. But I am persuaded to believe that if there had been only one that was lost, I believe, I believe the Lord Jesus would have still come. I believe he would have still suffered all of the torment of the cross and shedding his precious blood. He would have still gone to that borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he would have still risen. I believe he would still be seated at the right hand of the Father until that one came. I want you to know today, I'm glad for the work of just one. And I'm one that he saved. Number two, the weight of just one. I love this. Verse number five, it says, And when he hath found it, he layeth it, layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. Let me read you a verse of scripture. Isaiah chapter number six, uh, chapter number nine, verse number six. Listen to this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Do you know, you know, the word of God is so precise in its, in its wording. I love the preciseness of scripture. Isaiah chapter number 9 and verse number 6 is, a, is the prophecy of the Lord Jesus as he reigns on earth for that thousand years. And look at this. It says that, that, the, that the weight of the, of the um, governments of this world shall be upon his shoulder singular. Would you look with me back in Luke chapter number uh, 15 and verse number 5? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, plural. Here's what I believe. I'm a heretic, I know, but here's what I believe. I believe that one sinner, one sinner is more important to the, to the lovely Lord Jesus Christ more than all of the administrations of the government of this world. One sinner. On one shoulder he will, po he will pose all of the administration of this entire world for that thousand year reign. But the moment that you get saved, whew, he picks you up and he puts you on his shoulders. Uh, you know, I think about the weight of a, of, a, of a sheep. And I think about those shoulders that are able to bear that sheep. Can I tell you, first of all, that's the place where that sin was born. Uh, can I liken it this way? Uh, it's a bad illustration, but um, Miss Betty, I was looking to see what kind of shoes you got on. I don't know if we have any ladies in here with stiletto heels. But they tell us, and I looked this up on the internet. You, find, you know, Wikipedia is good for all, everything. You can believe everything you find on the internet. But here's what I found. 
They tell us that a 100-pound woman wearing a pair of stiletto heels, which is, you know, about a, you know, a little, bitty, little bitty square like that, that the force, the, the pounds per square inch, the force of her heel when she steps on you is, is 1,500 pounds. It converts from a 100-pound woman to 1,500 pounds per square inch. Anybody ever been stepped on by a lady's high heel? Wow, 1,500 pounds. Well, they tell us that an elephant, a 6,000-pound elephant, because of the way it walks and displacing, because it's always got two feet on the ground, two feet on the ground, a 6,000-pound elephant only, only has, by force, 75 pounds per square inch. That tells me that a 100-pound woman weighs more than a 6,000-pound elephant. <laughs> okay? But can I tell you what, what God the Father did in a few short hours? He took all of the sin of all men and all of the wrath of God for all eternity, and He compressed it, and He compressed it, and He compressed it, and he laid it all, all the wrath of God. He laid it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's no wonder he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The weight of sin. But can I tell you what else it is? It's that, it's that place of security. Those shoulders that are there. You, you see that lost sheep had ventured out on its own. I know better. I know my own way. I can find better grass. I can find better place to, to water. I can find everything better. And that's what mankind did, walked away from God here. And, but the shepherd comes looking. And he picks up that sheep which is worn and tired, maybe bruised and broken, puts it on his shoulders and off he goes. And can I tell you, number one, that's the place of rest. That sheep is not having to walk anymore. Miguel, I'm telling you, that's peace when I don't have to walk anymore. He's carrying me all the way. But it's also a place of security in that on, on his shoulders, every danger that the sheep would ever confront would have to go through that shepherd to get to him. And I'm glad that I'm secure in him forever and forever. I'm glad for the weight of a sheep that it's not too heavy for him to bear, that I'm not too big, not too... Not, I'm glad that his shoulders are just right for me and he carries me. I don't know about you. I don't even know, you know, I'm glad he loves me. He loves me more than he loves you, I believe. <laughs> oh, I'm glad he loves me. Last of all, the wonder of just one. And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he, when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Rejoice with me, the wonder of just one. I mean, you're talking about one old, one old sheep that was a rebel, was no good. He comes back with, with his wool matted, with, with the things, you know, all this filth and nasty and everything but here he comes rejoice with me I found but what about all the trouble you went through to find it what about what about all the expense rejoice with me that's what the Lord Jesus said I like it when people can rejoice over just one getting saved have you ever have you ever had the joy of knowing that somebody now let me, can I just ex explain something just a second the process of the salvation of, of a sinner Sometimes you have been the one who planted the seed and you watered and you got to get to see the fruit. But it's not, most of the time it's not that way. Most of the time somebody planted and you get to come along and you get to water or you get to come along and you get to reap the fruit. It's, an, it's a team effort, if I can say it that way. But we can still rejoice. It doesn't matter if, I got to, if, I, if I'm the one that planted or if I'm the one to water or even if I got to be the one to, to, to reap the benefit, to reap the harvest. We all get to have part. The thing that he wants us to do is just do something. Just do something and to be able to rejoice. Let me give you something. I'm talking about just one. Um, please forgive me. I, I, I'm, so, I'm just a proud papa, I reckon. I'm a proud dad, I guess I could say. I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk about one for just a second. If you go on the website, I mean, go on Google Maps today. I went, I went to look today because Google is always refreshing their, their street views, you know. 
But a few months ago, my daughter-in-law, Amanda, called me up and she said, I want you to, I want you to look at something. If you go to the website of our son's church, now our son lives in the building, and that's how they were able to get the building and make the payment, but they, and they still live in the building. But um, they were getting ready to go on a trip. They just bought a little RV for $5,000, and in order to kind of get away from the church, there's campgrounds all around the city of Trois-Rivières, and, and they, had, they were out there working. Well, here, nobody knows that they live in the church, pretty much, except the church members. And, and so one day, a little boy comes up to the door, and, and um, he, he knocks on the door, and um, Jason um, introduces himself to this little boy, and this little boy just thinks it's a church, but Jason, he was wanting some water. And Jason gave the little boy a bottle of water, but he gave this little boy a track. And uh, Amanda, I don't even remember why she was looking. Oh, well, she just wanted to see what the update was on the website. And so the name of the church is Église Baptiste de la Foi, and it's, it's found in the city of Trois-Rivières. And if you want to look at it afterwards, you sure can. But... Um, Amanda went to look at the, at the view because when, you, when this little boy came, Jason gave him a bottle of water and gave him a track. You don't know what happens to tracks. You don't know what happens, but this little fellow, look, Jason said, was 12, 13, 14 years old. And when you go to the street view of Jason's church, you're going to find this little boy sitting at the telephone pole reading this little gospel track. When you pull it up close, you can even see the track in his hand. Can I tell you, I, I don't know what happened to this little boy, but for five weeks, I mowed that grass. I mowed, I mowed around that telephone pole. And I prayed for that little boy. That's just one. Just one. When Jason started the church, he had folks coming that didn't know anything about church. They didn't know how to discipline their kids in church. This one family that began to come, they had a little girl. Her name is Kellyanne. This, she was just a little thing, just, a, just about probably 15 months old or so. And she'd walk all over while Jason's preaching. She'd get over and bang on the piano. Well, Jason could have said, would you control this child or leave? You know what Jason would do? He would go and he'd pick Kellyanne up. And he would walk around with Kellyanne. And he'd just preach. When she, got to, when, she, when she was able to talk, you know what she called my son? She called him Pastor Jesus. That's, that's all Jason talked about. Kellyanne, she's now nine years old. Last, um, last year, she called Jason up, I think it was October, November, about a year ago. She called Jason up and he said, uh, she said, Jason, can I bring Kellyanne over? Kellyanne wants to be saved. So they bring Kellyanne over because she wanted to talk. And she just calls him pastor now. And she found out he's really not Jesus. But, <laughs> but um, Jason got to lead Kellyanne to the Lord. And she, she goes to an English-speaking school. Her mom speaks perfect English. And she wanted her to go to English-speaking school. And she had an assignment in school uh, this past year. And this, the assignment is to write a short paragraph about an important person in your life. She got 90 on, the grade, on her grade, and this is the, a copy of it. She got 90 on her grade because she had a few misspelled words. But here's what she wrote. The most important person in my life is a person who Christians believe in. His name is God. As Christians, we believe that he created the world, or the whole world, including us. We also believe that he is the king of kings. To communicate, we do something called praying. To tell some of his stories, he sent us a book called The Bible to all Christians, he is the most important person in our lives. We, we love our God. Amen. Can I tell you what that is? That's just one. Amen. Can I tell you another story? I, and I will close with this. I told you the other day that our son Joshua, he, um, on this trip, he called me up and said that the Lord had he'd surrendered to preach. The last church that they were going to visit was a church in Illinois, Flora, Illinois, and um, there's a little bus kid in, in church that when he saw Joshua, the little kid's nine years old, and when he saw Joshua, he just clung on to him. You know, he didn't want to leave him. And, and so during the morning invitation, the little boy went forward and he said something to the pastor and, and he, the little boy's pointing back at, at Joshua and the pastor motioned for Joshua to come up there uh, to talk to him. Well, what the little boy wanted, he wanted to be saved and he wanted Joshua to lead him to the Lord. 
And so Joshua got to lead him to the Lord, a little bus kid. Well, that night, guess what happened? That little nine-year-old boy that rides the bus in the mornings, just comes to church in the mornings, he was back at church with his whole entire family. And he went around and he said, let me tell you what happened to me this morning. I got saved. And he was just going, I got saved this morning. Just telling everybody. And, and uh, the pastor had said to him that morning, he said, you want to tell everybody what happened to you? And he said, no, I don't want to. But that night, I, I, I got saved. I just everybody. And he went to the pastor. He said, pastor, can I tell everybody what happened to me? Well, they had an ice cream social afterwards, and, uh, uh, and uh, he was going around there, everybody. He said they got special ice cream for everybody that got saved this morning. Can I tell you what that is? That's just one. But that's one that Jesus loves. A little bus kid that somebody loved enough to pick up on a bus. And somebody, Sunday after Sunday, told about Jesus. All Joshua got to do was just reap the glorious benefit of what somebody had done in laboring. But you know what? It was just one. But that's one that's not going to have to spend eternity in hell. Rejoicing over one, the wonder of it. You know what you are? You're just one. But the day that you got saved, there was rejoicing in heaven over you. And if you get saved today, can I tell you, guarantee you, there will be rejoicing over you if you'll just come. Let's stand to our feet, our heads are bowed as your pastor comes this morning. Father, I pray that you'd work in the hearts and lives of your people this morning. And I pray for those that don't know you as their Savior, that this morning they might be saved. And I will give you honor and glory and praise for all that you do. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ, you've never realized you were a sinner, you've never put your faith and trust in Christ to save you, and today you're ready to trust Christ. I want to help you. If you'd hold your hand up, I'll have a counselor come to you. We'll talk to you in private. We'll answer your questions and we'll help you come to know the Lord Jesus. Would there be anybody in the room like that? Would you just hold your hand up and let me know that so I can help you? Would there be anybody like that? Would there be anybody in this room this morning that would say, Boy, I believe God's calling me to be a missionary. I believe God wants me to go and surrender my life to give to missions, give my life to missions to carry the gospel to just one somewhere around the world. If that's you, would you hold your hand up? Is there anybody like that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? And then if there's somebody in this room today that would say, you know, I haven't been given. I haven't been participating in the faith promise. But I believe the Lord's zeal in my heart. If you'd raise your hand, I'd like to pray for you also. Is there anybody who hasn't been, but you want to start being a giver through the faith promise and help us get the gospel around the world? Would you hold your hand up? Is there anybody like that? Thank you. Thank you. I see some hands. Thank you. Father God, I pray you'd bless today. And I pray you'd help your people to serve you and honor you. I pray, God, that you'd have them surrender their life and be greatly used of you. And I'll give you praise for all you do. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd invite you to come forward, find a place to pray, and ask God to work in your life. Ask God to help you do whatever you just raised your hand about. And somebody who didn't raise your hand, you might want to come. You can pray in your seat. You can sit down there where you are. You can come forward. But I would like to ask you, right now to make a decision to honor the Lord Jesus. And so we'll uh, let you pray. And whenever you finish praying, you can sing with Stephen. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will Trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus.
You can have a seat. I'm so glad you came today. How many of you have enjoyed it today? Say amen. amen. How many of you have enjoyed the week? Did you enjoy that too? Amen? amen. All right. We'll be doing it again. Evangelism. If you're not already signed up to give to Faith Promise, I hope that you will be signing up soon. So far, 51 cards have been turned in and $99,858 have already been promised. And there will be many more cards to come in, I'm sure. And I just am excited about the opportunity to have you given uh, so much money to get the gospel around the world. Now, uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, 4.20, there'll be no meeting. We'll be back at 5 o'clock. We're not going to have any announcements, though. James is already here. I know you're here. I thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being so faithful to church. I do love you. I am so privileged to work with you. I could never tell you how blessed I feel to be a part of this church and to work with you and the way you carry the gospel around the world. Carla, it's good to have you here, uh, and we're glad you came today, and I'm glad all of you came. We're going to do as much as we can to carry the gospel around the world. Amen? Y estoy súper contento con la iglesia hispana, y estoy contento que han venido acá abajo, y estoy esperando que Dios haga grandes cosas acá en sus vidas. I'm happy the Spanish people are down here. If you're happy about that, they say amen. amen. They'll be back upstairs tonight. And they'll continue on, and we're just praying that God will do greater things than he has ever done before. What a privilege to serve God. Are you excited or not? Let's go tell somebody about Jesus. Thank you very much. You're dismissed.